Hello, uh, welcome to this presentation about uh, Linux codec. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Nicolas Dufresne. I've been uh, working at Collabora for over a decade. Uh, I'm a core GStreamer developer, and I contribute from time to time to uh, the Linux media subsystem uh, as a reviewer for the API, uh, as a power user of the API. And I've been contributing to uh, enhancing the codec support for a couple of years now. So Linux codec on the <clears throat> on Linux codec support isn't a, a new thing. It started quite a while ago. In fact, it started in 2011. In 2011, uh, Google partners with Samsung and Asus in order to produce the first ARM Chromebook. It's, uh, it's based on Exynos uh, 5 SOC. It included uh, the Samsung MFC decoder, which uh, today we denote as a, as, a <clears throat> as a stateful decoder. So back then, everything was really great. The laptop came out. All these drivers, these new subsystem came, came in mainline. Everything was uh, fully mainline. So what's a stateful decoder? Because we cannot start a discussion about stateless decoder if we don't really understand the difference. So consider the stateful decoder as a black box. And the black box will contain typically a processor, or it could be called a DSP or something else. And this processor will receive a bit stream. So it's an encoded video stream. It will process it and do whatever it, it's needed to feed some accelerator, that's what ACC means, in order to produce images. So it's quite straightforward. Now, what Google came, came with, uh, basically there was nothing in the Linux kernel that was already supporting this model where you feed in some memory on one side and feed out some memory. So in order to do that, they extended uh, the V4L node in order to support two queues. So they added the output queue, which is the actual input of the memory to, to memory device. I know it's very confusing, but it, they had to live with the legacy of V4L API. So the output queue receives the bit stream. And they also added a capture queue, a bit like a camera capture queue. And this one will produce the images, the decoded images. On top of that, they add some support for uh, draining, flushing, things that are needed to seek inside your stream or to end your stream. Now, it's a great, simple technology. It's, it's very minimal. To implement this in user space, you need a very minimal understanding of the codex because you just need to pass the, 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 the the frame you receive from the demuxer, basically from another piece of software to the hardware, and you get images back in the right order. Uh, the downside is that pretty much all of these hardware requires a firmware because you need a program to run on the processor, which is often a custom architecture. So it's a proprietary firmware, firmware using proprietary uh, compiler. So it's not very open friendly. And it can be very hard to multiplex. Your ability to run multiple streams depends on the API implemented on that processor and the memory on that processor. So it, it has some limitation, but it's very quick to integrate. So the story about uh, stateful uh, decoders and encoders actually continued. In 2014, we saw the Coda driver uh, being merged. This was developed by Pengutronics, uh, Philip Zabel. Uh, it was to support the Chips and Media Coda chipset, the 960 initially, and then the HX4, which is IMX51, uh, found on IMX51. So it gives you the IMX6 and IMX51 support mainline for both decoders and encoders. Uh, this effort was all reverse engineering, engineer from, uh, from NXP uh, binary blobs and some documentation found here and there. Now, the story continue. Uh, everything was good. Uh, everybody was happy with that until 2015. 2015, <clears throat> Google started to partner with Rockchip 
in order to build a second generation of ARM Chromebook. But these ARM, the, the, these SOC no longer had a, a processor with their codec. Instead, they had what we call a stateless decoder. It was the, the beginning of stateless, uh, assumed to be a rock chip design uh, back then. So unlike the previous Chromebook, it didn't go as well in the upstreaming side. So even though uh, Google have made great effort to produce, uh, I mean, upstreamable code, it didn't get in right away. So, so that's where they were. Whoops, wrong button, sorry. Now, to make the analogy, a stateless decoder doesn't have a processor. So it's basically, it exposed the accelerators in a certain box with a certain set of parameters. And in order for the user space to drive these accelerators, now you, you don't only have to pass the bitstream. In fact, you will pass a subset of the bitstream. You will have to pass the reference frame that are used in the decoding process. And you, you'll have to pass a fairly large amount of parameters for that frame or that slice to be decoded in order to obtain a picture. And the picture is no longer in the presentation order. So you might have to do some a little more work. Now, some of you may wonder, how is that different from the GPU decoder? Well, the truth is that it's not different. It's the same model. It's, it's stateless. The difference with your GPU is that, uh, the <clears throat> is that the accelerator is actually exposed through the comment stream. So you send a comment to a coprocessor, and that coprocessor will uh, take this comment and feed the registry, the registers for your accelerators. So there's an indirection through your GPU. It, and this comment stream is a bit stream, and it has to be crafted. And traditionally, the for, for GPUs in Linux, we actually use user space in order to construct the bit stream. So it's different in that in that sense. And these API would be exposed through user space driver, a VA API driver, VDPAU driver, or on Windows with the XVA2 driver, or uh, with, with NVIDIA would be NVDEC driver, which is cross-platform. So it's slightly different. Now, could we have integrated those stateless decoder as being GPU? Of course, we could. We would have had to create a generic bitstream for those. That would have been nice. But then we would have had to deal with the fact that we have only one really suitable API, which is VA API, which has some limitation. And you have to deal with multiple GPUs, which until Vulkan was fairly hard to do. So that's not what Google did. And they were in 2015. So Vulkan was not very, very big back, back then. So they decided to extend the stateful decoder model. So same, same model, output and capture, and add a set of controls to pass the parameters. So basically, the, the, the fact that V4L has a queue of buffers and is aware of the buffers will allow to symbolically refer to the reference frame. So you don't need to queue them. So you can put that in your controls. But then you pass controls. But the semantic of controls in V4L are that they are applied to the next frame to be decoded. But we have a queue of frames. So they needed an extra mechanism. And that's where they came out with the request uh, API. So the request API is a way to queue uh, parameters, controls, and uh, bitstream buffers for a specific request. So they are decoded, they are handled together by the, uh, by the processing. Uh, now the request API was meant to be used also for cameras. We'll see where it goes. There's nothing implemented yet in this regard. So it was added to the media controller API. So we had to place our VPU, our M2M inside a media controller with the nice addition that the media controller has a topology. So there's now a way to describe the functions of your hardware, which make identification of your memory to memory driver much easier. Uh, uh, just to compare with the stateful decoder, we would look at the formats and try to guess if this is a decoder on an encoder or a color transform or a scalar. While with the topology, we can navigate the topology and we'll find uh, a node 
which has a function. And this function is decoder, which makes things uh, much simpler. Now, would it be complete understanding of stateless decoder if I don't give you an example of, uh, of, of a format that has been decoded? So I, I took H264 uh, because it's fairly complex, but it represents well the, the work that you have to do in user space in order to handle those, those, those codecs. So H264, H264 works with sequence of NALU. So the a unit of transmission is a NALU. And these NALU have different functions. So just a couple of well-known NALUs, the SPS, which is the sequence parameter set. Uh, this is a set of parameters that you need to carry on that you will use for multiple pictures. And then the picture parameter set are extra parameters that you will need during the decoding, both in user space and by the accelerators. Then you got the slices. The IDR slices are slices that do not refer to other uh, decoded pictures or the I slices, but I, I picked the IDR. I know, let's not get into the detail for that, but IDR and I slices. And then you got the P slices, which are slices that will use previously presented uh, pictures in order to decode themselves and the B slices, which will use pictures that will be decoded, that, that will be presented in the future or and in the past actually to decode themselves. So they have both uh, past and future uh, references. How does it work in practice? Basically you decode the, the, the B slices later than they are presented. It means that the decoding order differs from the present presentation order. So there's a whole specification and a process to reorder the, the, these frames and to present them uh, at the right time. Now the NALU can be uh, streamed in two formats. So you got the start code, the Annex B uh, format. With the start code, you have uh, three bytes, zero, zero, one. It's a pattern that you can search inside your binary in order to find the, the, the beginning of a, of, a, of a NAL and to start your parsing, parse processing. So you can start from any random point in the stream. And it's quite suitable for TV streaming over the air where you actually join the stream at any moment. And you got the AVCC format, which instead of this start code, we actually announce the size of the following slide slice. So if you want to walk over slices, you can actually skip by size, which is much faster and much more efficient. And this is used for storage like ISO MP4 or uh, Matroska. Now, in order to decode this, and this is just a quick overview, so you have an idea of the complexity, but not that complex. Understand that everything I'm mentioning there has a specification. And if you follow properly the recipe, which is, of course, written in prose and not in code, you'll get the right result. It's, it's a recipe. But basically, you have to locate and parse all the NAL headers, uh, which will give you basically the type of the NALs that you're dealing with. Then the non-VCL, so the non-display NALs, have to be processed by user space. So you accumulate this information. Uh, and you also need to parse the header part of a slice. Uh, with this information, you'll be able to calculate the frame number and handle any gaps. That's the purpose of the frame number. And calculate the picture order count, the puck and the picnim, which is used in the reordering process and the referencing process. There's a lot more, but this is just an overview. Now, some decoders are slice-based. Think VA API or a Cidrus driver. We'll come to that later. And some are frame-based. If they are slice-based, you need to give a lot more information. So you need to prepare some reference list uh, in advance, as the hardware won't do it for you. Then at that point, it's the right moment where you can actually program the hardware. So you can fill the SPS, PPS, decode parameters, slice parameters. That's V4L specific. And uh, you can also <clears throat> Uh, prepare the finalized uh, reference list. So we call them the modified reference list or L0 and L1 and pass that to the hardware and the hardware will decode the slice. And when that is decoded, remember it's out of order. So now you can do what we call the DPB management. So display picture buffer management, which is a process, another recipe that will give you which 
buffer is ready to be outputted to your screen. And that's about it. That's what you have to do in every single software. Uh, on V4L side, though, it's a much simpler API because everything is ordered. So you allocate a, uh, a request, which is a file descriptor. Uh, you set per frame slice or uh, per frame or per slice parameters that you associate with that request. So when you set the control, you pass the request FD. You queue the bitstream buffer. Again, you pass the request FD. And then you queue the request itself. That's an API. Queue the request. And then you can wait on that request for this job to be done. And you're good. You can continue with the next decoding. It's a bit simpler than the, the traditional V4L approach. Uh, but as I said, this didn't land immediately, and time passed. So now we went from 2015 to 2016. There's another stateful decoder, the MediaTek VPU, that got added with a couple of formats, with the particularity that this one only produced tile format, which is a, a new era. You can probably talk with Neil Armstrong about the subject. It's a, it's a whole subject for a talk, so I'm going to skip this bit. In 2007, even though the, the driver started a while back, uh, the Venus driver for a Qualcomm chipset actually landed. And it landed with both uh, stateful decoder and stateful encoder. And uh, as of today, it's the most capable driver with the, the largest list of codec uh, uh, supported. So pretty much everything you would need is supported there. But as for the upstreaming of the stateless, it was pretty much stalled. Uh, the reason for this stall was, I mean, it was normal. People were, were actively working on it, but they had to settle on the request API. And there was a lot of uh, indirection. At some point, the request API was called job API. And then it came back to request API, and <clears throat> some detail had to be uh, tweaked. And all this was done uh, by maintainers that didn't have a very large knowledge of codecs. In fact, they had pretty much no, no knowledge of handling a low-level codec. So they had to learn this. And that, that's what takes most of the time, to get, to get enough knowledge by the maintainers to be able to be confident that this is the right thing to merge. And there was only one hardware that was supported, the RUC chip. And to make it worse, there was not yet a formal specification, even though there was no formal specification to handle the, the stateful codec. And that got fixed meanwhile. But that was quite a problem, because uh, th that was a problem for consistencies and, and portabilities of the solution. Now, everything started again with Bootlin. So Paul and Maxim from Bootlin came in and, and created this Kickstarter with the goal to uh, make a mainline driver for the all-winner VPUs. So, so what they end up managing to do, managed to do actually, is to uh, help finalize the request API. So that got finalized and merged upstream. They <clears throat> they actually managed to get. The, the first Cydrus driver, so they call the driver Cydrus. It's the all-winner VPU. It's named after the, the, the property stack they were actually reverse engineering, so with MPEG-2 support. So that was quite a good start. MPEG-2 is much simpler than H.264. And H.264 was being, uh, being developed actively uh, with the target goal to implement a VA driver for that codec. Uh, as a stopgap. So with VA driver, they would get a user space support much quicker because VA was already supported by some browsers and by FFmpeg uh, and other other systems and, and GStreamer. In 2019, things started to speed up a little bit. And uh, my team, well, Collabra, not really me directly, but some folks at Collabra, uh, Boris and Ezekiel, started to work on uh, finalizing the rock chip up driver upstreaming. So take the opportunity of that movement to actually get somewhere with that. And that's where the, 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 the rock chip driver was finally uh, mainline. Uh, Cedrus gained H.264, but also HEVC support. Uh, 
And then the uh, the controls for the codex were added, but they are added as a staging API. I'm not sure if a staging API was really a concept back then, but now it is. So it's an API that only exists inside the kernel, and you have to copy code from inside the kernel if you want to implement it. <clears throat> this uh, was a way to actually get things upstream earlier so we can collaborate <clears throat> on all this and finalize all the API. And we're actually still working on the API, and there has been, there has been a proposal last week to finalize the, the upstreaming. Oh, and in 2019, uh, Rockchip driver actually got renamed. And I, I got a little story about that, and that's, that's quite interesting. So at the same time, we were working on, on this, on the Rockchip 3288 and Rockchip 3399. <coughs> Sorry. So Chris Helly from uh, Zodiac, uh, which is now Safran, actually uh, was talking to me about the, the new uh, in-flight entertainment system based on IMX8M uh, device that they were coming back. And he was saying that he, he, was, he was going to join with his team, while well, his team being uh, Philip Zabel at Pendutronics, uh, the, 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 the group of people working on stateless codec, and that he knew that the, the codec was a Hantro, a G1 and a G2 there. So I was a bit curious. Uh, a bit later, he sent me a, an evaluation kit so I could try it out and have just play with the, the IMX 8M quad, which was brand new. And uh, what's cool with NXP is that you can actually go on the website and in exchange of your email address, which can be annoying, but yeah, in exchange of your email address, you actually get the specification for the board. And sometimes some bits of the specification are missing. But the codec was not missing. It was there. And I also had the specification for the rock chip. And I started comparing side to side the registers. And what I found out is that, well, it was the same hardware, just kind of an older version on the rock chip. So uh, about the same day, I wrote to Philip Zabel. And I think I told him, oh, maybe you, you should speak with Ezekiel and Boris. They might have upstreamed the driver you're, you're, you're going to write. <laughs> And that's where it started. And IMX8M actually arrived very, very quickly afterward, as most of the work was there. Little, uh, if you're curious about what Hantro is, so Hantro was, uh, it's no longer, a, a Finnish company producing codecs that got bought by Antu. And Antu got bought by Google. And uh, while at Google, the Hantu folks actually produced uh, the, well, the very well-known VP8 and VP9 royalty-free codex. And they also, with the Hantro, the Hantro folks at Antu at Google, it's kind of nested, actually uh, made hardware design for these codex, and they actually give it for free to Silicon vendors. I think they still do that today. And uh, later, Google sold the Hantro team to Very Silicon. And Very Silicon is actually uh, keeping the work on these codex, and there's new version coming. Well, published and coming. It was interesting because uh, when we discovered that it was Hantro codec and not Rockchip, we had we renamed the staging driver as it was staging. It was not an API yet, but it reminded me of this story about STM Mac. So STM Mac is an Ethernet driver uh, that was thought to be an STM design, but later they found that it was actually a design where. Uh, design. And it's not just a design wear. It's actually the design wear used on most SBC uh, today for, for gigabit Ethernet. And But still today, because of API stability, we had to keep the STM Mac name, even though it's not specific to STM chips. So history avoided. Nice catch. We were pretty happy. Now, all this effort was would not have been possible without the help of the community. So at some point in 2019, perhaps a little earlier, I'm not too sure of the dates there, uh, but uh, Librelec and Cody uh, contributors actually came by and they produced a port of FFmpeg that supports the, uh, the those stateless codec. The, the port is not <clears throat> mainline yet because the FFmpeg people would like the uh, the API to be final before they merge it into the trunk. But you can download the, the fork on Quibu's uh, rep Git repository. If, if you ever need it, come by on Slack. I'll give you the, the link. They provided lots of bug fixes. They've been testing corner case, testing a lot of com 
I mean, slightly broken streams and everything. And they also provided interlaced content with matters for, for, for their use cases. The, not all chips support uh, interlaced content yet, but this is to, to, but the API itself has been fixed already. Now, things didn't stop. So in 2020, RK3399 support has been merged. This time, we believe it's a proper uh, rock chip design. So it's a, it has its own driver. Uh, in GStreamer, something moved. So we started having a, a base class base classes for codecs. So basically a framework to handle stateless codec. FFM FFmpeg had that for years, many, many years. And that's probably why they have a richer uh, amount of stateless uh, codec interface supported. But that was finally added to GStreamer in order to support uh, DXVA and NVDEC. By the way, big thanks to Chromium, as most of the code we have there is based on their code. And I added uh, GStreamer H.264 and VP8 decoding support using the V4L stateless interface. And uh, we don't have FFmpeg restrictions, so that landed into GStreamer uh, plugins bad, bad being our staging in GStreamer. And I was supposed to present all of this at Embedded World uh, this year, which got canceled because of the COVID. Uh, but nothing of that is, is lost. It's available to, to everyone. And we're still working on it. We're still improving. I'm trying to finalize the API, and I'm trying to help out. And I'm going to add more support into GStreamer uh, later. Might try and help in the upstreaming of the FFmpeg. There's a lot of projects ahead of us. Meanwhile, the, VA, the effort to produce a VA API driver have stopped. Uh, as GStreamer got native support, Chromium got, got native support, and uh, FFmpeg has working and up, I mean, uh, ready to merge patches for upstream support. Uh, the VA support was not really meaningful anymore. So it was abandoned. Now, what does this, this do? And this is just a little subset of what this effort enables. Uh, it enables actually uh, using blob free, doing blob free decoding on hardware. So notably uh, on the left, you can see the MNT Reform laptop, which, an, which is an IMX8M uh, la laptop. <clears throat> uh, in the middle, you can find the Pine 64, which is based on all winner 64, A64, sorry, which has the Cydrus uh, driver. And on the right, uh, the Purism Librem 5 phone, which is also an IMX8M phone. And all these projects that I selected uh, actually aim at, at having uh, royalty-free, well, not royalty-free, but uh, actually blob-free uh, OS for their platform in order to better support open source. So now it's showtime. I have a live demo for you. Uh, it's going to be a screen sharing. It's a bit flicky to get the screen sharing, so I might do a little back and forth, but let's hope it's going to work. I'm going to present you this little board. So this is uh, made by uh, Libra Computer. I really like what they do. Uh, they basically invest their personal money into making very cheap integration of various SOC. This SOC is the uh, all winner H3. So I'm going to dem demonstrate GStreamer running stateless codec with latest kernel, latest GStreamer, and everything on this device. And because I could, I only have one artifact of my embedded world demo, I'm going to play back a video of my embedded world demo in there, which I'll explain. So let's try and set up the, uh, the screen share now. Oh, wait, I need to plug this in. So as it's doing TFTP boot, I'm going to plug a little Ethernet. Um, in order to show you, I'm using a USB HDMI capture card over here. So I'm going to plug the HDMI that. And when the screen sharing is on, I'm going to put some USB power in order to boot it up. So let's get this sharing working. It's a bit of a dance. Voila, hope it works. So now let's uh, 
plug this in so we can boot that board. Let's hope it's going to work. Oh, yeah, it boots. Great. So on this board, I'm actually running uh, uh, Fedora uh, rootfs. Why Fedora? Because uh, this is the same as I use on my PC. Uh, so I have the tool to manage uh, the rootfs. I can do DNF for the platform on my main PC. Let's log in. Oops, if I turn on the little keyboard, it's going to work better. There we go. Super secret password. Now, as I said, I'm running uh, quite a recent kernel. So it's a uh, 5.7 RC2. I'm not sure which day it was. Uh, I think I got one patch, which I've submitted to the, the mailing list, a little bug in Cedrus that was affecting GStreamer, but not FFmpeg. And now I'm going to load uh, GStreamer uninstall. So and GStreamer has a, a, has a build tool called GST build, because GStreamer is made of multiple repositories, which are hard to manage. So GST build is an aggregator based on Mesin in order to build the integrity of GStreamer. And it has some facility that, that allow you to run uh, in place uh, the plugin. So this little command will load a huge environment, which will go fetch the, the, the plugin shared object where they are in the build tree instead of having a single directory like you will. It takes a bit of a bit of a while because there's a lot of file and we're over NFS. Uh, I don't have any graphical uh, setup. So I'm going to use a little command line player called GST Play. Uh, I need actually Playbin Treat for the negotiation to work properly with KMS. Uh, there's some limitation of Playbin 2 there. And uh, that will be displayed over uh, KMS Sync. Uh, and on this device, the and most newer device, actually, the video layers is an underlay. So we don't see it by default. Uh, but the all winner is very capable. You can actually uh, flip that over. So I change the Z position to 2 in order to bring it up front. Now it's pre-rolling. So it means that it's preparing, it's, it's buffering in order to display the frames. There we go. So let's pause there. Uh, on the left, that's the monitor of a streaming server that is uh, that is demoed there. And in three different protocols, we're actually streaming to an IMX8 evaluation kit, which is on the second screen. Over here, this device, this is actually, uh, uh, well, Zodiac, but Safran, actually, next generation of in-flight entertainment device which we uh, embedded a Western demo. And uh, we're demoing actually uh, dragging around some underlays. So there's two hardware underlays and one GL overlay being used there that we can dry, drag around and, and do so some smooth stuff there. So voila, that's it for the demo. So let's stop this share. So now it's a uh, question time. I'll try to, I got, I think I got five minutes of question left, something. So I'll try to answer as many as I can. And uh, let's see how it goes. So I need to click on this and publish. So let's take the first one. Yes. So what exactly is an accelerator? Um, what we use as a term for accelerators is a piece of hardware that actually uh, doesn't do the entire work. So it's, it only accelerates some of the decoding. But in, in, in case of the stateless decoder, you still need to go through the decoding process. So you, you implement, uh, I would say, a third of the specification of the decoding. And the accelerator with the parameters will handle mostly the mathematical part of the processing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if accelerator was fully proper for this one. Uh, if you consider the, the one that provides you algorit algorithm for encryption, that that's a better match for accelerators. But yeah. Next question. Uh, do we also get a performance benefit with stateless? So. Uh, Yes, but probably not the way you think. 
So when you use a stateless decoder, you have to do a lot more work on the processor. So uh, you actually wake up the main processor more often. So in some ways, it could be considered a performance degradation. But with the stateless decoder, you actually have a, tight, a finer control of the decoding, and you can reduce the latency introduced by uh, those firmwares, which usually will implement uh, the proper decoding model, which adds some delays to do perfect timing at the output. So yes, you can gain some performance there. And if you have a chip like the Cedrus on the All Winner, which is slice, slice based, you can enable slices, which is basically uh, splitting the, 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 the encoding in multiple region. Well, it's a contiguous, in H.264, it's contiguous set of macro blocks. And, and you can decode them as they arrive over the network. So by the time you receive the last slice, the remaining time, the latency, is only the, uh, it's only the, the time it takes to decode the last slice. So you actually win in latency. Uh, this is not something I've tested yet or I've implemented yet, but this is definitely a goal in there. So you can gain in uh, latency, especially for streaming. Uh, simple question there. Will the slide be available online? I will be uploading it on SCED uh, right after. So if you have SCED, just go there. You'll be able to get the, the slides in PDF form. Uh, this is a test. Uh, these are mask. This one. Oh, another question. No, same question again. Did I go over all the question already? Yeah, I think so. Oh, there's a new question. So, uh, oops, I need to publish. Yes. So the question is, uh, could you share the spec of the device used on the demo? So it's complicated. The device used on the demo is a, a all winner H3. So it doesn't have a public spec. I don't have a public spec for that one. Uh, it's a reverse engineering effort. But uh, I, I can post on the Slack channel the link to the wiki of the reverse engineering documentation that is found on Sunshi, Linux Sunshi uh, group. So S-U-N-X-I is the, the term used to reference these boards. Uh, so I'll try to put that uh, on Slack after this, uh, this presentation. And voila, I think that's it. Any other questions? So effort is not done. We still actively work on this. Uh, thanks for attending. I'll be on Slack to answer any more questions or uh, to send you links. Oh, actually, no, that's the same. Oh, yeah, there's another question. Let's take it. I have time, so. So this question is, do you use less power with stateless decoder? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, some of the decoding process is done on your CPU. So unless your main CPU is very is not uh, power hungry at all, that it would beat actually a coprocessor, uh, it's going to be more uh, more hungry on power. Ah, then this one is a GStreamer specific question. So the question is, can a V4L H.264 deck output the video with without copy to GPU memory? for color conversion. So first thing in that question that I need to correct is the differentiation. So V4L H.264 DEC is the decoder for stateful decoder. While uh, we we use actually a different name uh, for the, the state less decoder, it's gonna be V4L2 SL H.264 DEC in order to differentiate them. Uh, but the answer is yes, it's already able to zero copy uh, to GPU. It's actually what is being demo both on, well, on the demo I've showed you, I'm displaying to KMS. And on the demo I showed you inside the demo, I'm displaying to the Etnaviv uh, driver, the, the zero copy buffers. Now there's a limitation with Etnaviv. It doesn't support very well uh, NV12. So we use actually the POS processor on the, the Hantro VPU in order to convert to YUY2. 
So if your codec has a POS processor, that can do some other memory layout or other memory format, uh, it, it, it can help and you can display there. And we're also looking forward adding some uh, modifier and compression support there. But for that, we need, um, we need support uh, for modifiers in V4L. Oh, okay, another question. How well does it support decoding multiple stream in parallel? Are there priorities in V4L stateless? So basically the question is how do we parallelize the decoding in a stateless decoder? So the stateless decoder is stateless hardware wise. So each uh, instance of the V4L driver has a state, but the hardware can be multiplex because it's fully stateless. You ask for a frame. Uh, and all this is multiplex actually is a very simple. Uh, there's a lock on the usage of one a decoder instance. If there's multiple, there's going to be multiple luck, but that's not supported yet. And the Linux scheduler will will decide who's uh, who has the priority to take uh, hold on that resource. So it's it's scheduled by the same scheduler that schedule your process. So if you have a higher priority process, it will win the times uh, the timeshare on the the decoder. So that's the current implementation. This is of course. Uh, something that could evolve and improve. And the overhead of scheduling is uh, fairly, I mean, it's about none because uh, it's it's just, it decodes one frame. So you switch from frame to frame. It doesn't matter which stream this frame is from. So another, do I still got, yeah. Okay, let's publish this one. Apparently I got more more time. So is, is it still a good idea to transform a stateful codec to stateless? Is it still a good idea to transform? So it's a bit a question for a purist because uh, if power efficiency is your goal and you don't have any problem with the firmware you're using in terms of multiplexing streams, uh, you don't gain anything by going to stateless. But if uh, if the firmware is not good, it's not doing a great job at multiplexing and power efficiency, I mean, it's very small. So it's not like your main interest. Uh, you can gain from going to stateless. First, you, you, you remove the dependencies on a pr proprietary blobs and probably get away, uh, remove some of the bugs that, that you cannot fix because they're in the blobs. Uh, and and you gain in flexibility, definitely gain in flexibility. Uh, now, is it always possible? It depends on the architecture. Uh, I'll give you an example. Raspberry Pi has a new HEVC decoder, and this HEVC has been exposed as stateless. There's no driver yet, but we know that it's a stateless, and there's a, a reference code that has been published. And most decoders in the Raspberry Pi are likely similar so they could have been exposed to the main CPU. But right now, most of the, the, the decoders are exposed through uh, another processor. But some of the decoder are not accessible through the main CPU. You have to speak to the coprocessor. So converting them to stateless would mean that you have to write a new firmware that exposes them as stateless. And this is quite a lot of overhead in, in the process of dealing with stateless, but it would resemble a lot uh, of what GPU do, because those accelerators are on GPU and you speak to them with a stateless uh, bitstream, stateless protocol actually uh, to your GPU GPU card. So yes, there there is po possible gain there. I think it's gonna be the final question. So the question is, this history mentioned here is mostly applied to ARM, or is it uh, true for x86? So all x86 codec that have public implementation, open source code, are done through GPUs today. So AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel. So there's nothing in this V4L2 stateless uh, interface that currently applies to an x86 platform. Though the availability of this interface could allow some vendors, uh, I'm thinking of Matrox as an example, people I've, I've worked with, they could actually now implement a proper driver for their PCI card, 
which offer uh, an array of uh, of decoding accelerators. Uh, basically, they didn't have an, a kernel API for that. Now, vendors need to decide whether they offer a unified API for all the platforms. That's usually where they end up with the proprietary solution, or if they really want to support mainline Linux. So it's it's really a vendor decision here. So that's it for the question. That's it for this talks. Uh, hope this was useful and enhancing your knowledge of Codex. Uh, there's another question. I'll take it over uh, over Slack uh, right after. Thanks for watching. <laughs>